<laughs> okay, so we, a long, long time ago in the classroom right here, we were talking about, we're talking monetary policy, this thing that the Federal Reserve is a part of the U.S. government that, you know, they do the small tweaking that's done by financial professionals to try to smooth out the bumps in the economy. You know, they're not going to deal with wrecks, but they're going to deal with little speed bumps along the way. And we talked about a little bit of their options, including they set, which we're going to get to more of that later, they set the discount rate and the federal funds rate, the rates that banks can borrow money from the government and the banks, the rates that banks can borrow money from other banks. They said those, they print money, setting the money supply, printing more money, we'll put more dollar bills out there, so that's going to make each one worth less, which will actually cause inflation. We talked about all that 10 days ago, we all can't remember. Um, and we talked about reserve requirements, one of the, that was the last thing 10 days ago, where they tell the, the Fed will tell the bank what percentage of the money that they have on hand that they are allowed to lend. Versus having to keep on hand in case the borrower, in case the people that put money said these can't show up and knock on the door and say, I want my money back. But that's where we were. Does any of that ring any bell? If I tell you that you're ringing, I'm not going to go there. Yeah. My board isn't working, so thank you, man, friend. So, yeah. But I think that it should have. Oh, okay. So, um, changing the interest rate. You know, their goal is if we increase the interest rate, people are going to be like, ooh, I don't want to borrow money because it's more expensive for me to pay it back. Instead of me borrowing $100 from Haley and I have to pay her $105 back, well, I might change my mind if I borrow $100 from her and I got to pay her $110 or $120. So, raising the interest rate will slow down borrowing. And if I don't borrow that money from her, what am I not doing? Spending. And that would be a way to slow down the economy. And yes, it would slow down the economy. Because why was Haley willing to lend me that money in the first place? Because she didn't need it. She wasn't planning on spending it. If she was planning on spending that hundred dollars, is she gonna lend it to me? No. So she's got this extra money that she doesn't need, is just sitting there collecting dust. And if she lends it to me, I'll put that money out there in the economy. The economy grows. But if she does lend it to me, that money sits there and continues to collect dust, slowing down the economy. So that's the thing. Plus, there may be some of the others, like Sam, who just came in, and he's going to be sitting there. Maybe he has uh, some money, and he's sitting there saying, Well, okay, I've got some money, and I could use it to buy a new video game or a chainsaw or something like that. But, dude, the interest rate in the banks has gone up. So if I put it in a savings account, I'll actually get a real return on it. So raising interest rates that way will also slow down the economy. So you got two things. Number one, it slows down borrowing, and number two, it increases saving. In both cases, it's taking money from being spent to not being spent. And so lowering, so, so that's the thinking there. Raising interest rates slow down the economy, but then they can do the opposite. Lowering interest rates will speed up the economy. Lower the interest rates, Sam's sitting here, he's like, "I got extra money in those. Put it in savings account. Get a quarter of a percent. Forget that. I'll get a video game." Right. Uh, and I, Haley's uh, you know, only going to charge me two percent interest to borrow that hundred dollars from her. So what am I going to do? I'm going to borrow it. If yeah, she thinks she's going to get paid back, <laughs> so that money is going to get spent. So. But they don't just sort of snap their fingers, which I a little bit implied the other day that they do. They don't just snap their fingers and say, this is the interest rate that's going to get charged. What they do is they alter the amount of money out there. Because money is an item, just like anything else, there's a supply and a demand for it. And if they print more money, then you've increased the supply. What happens to the price of something when you increase supply? I would love to draw it on the board, but my board is perfect. But, uh, it's, uh, it's low. Yep. If you increase the supply, the price goes down, right? And what is the price of money? Did we mention that? The value goes up. The value goes up. Uh, it, 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 one, seven, the price of money is the interest rate. 
If I want Haley's money, I've got to pay for it. What do I got to pay? The interest rate, right? That's what it's going to cost me. So if you look in some econ textbooks, if none of you ever do, it, you'll actually sometimes somewhere you will see money being referred to as, I mean, the interest rate being referred to as the price of money. So if they print more money, the price of money goes down. Interest rates goes down. That's what's going to happen there. And by printing more money, as we talked about like a month ago when we talked about 65 Mustangs, the Spider-Man comic books, that kind of stuff. If there's more money out there, each of those pictures of a president is worth less. So if it's worth less, what do you got to do? Give me more of those in order to get my sun drop, get my phone, get my chainsaw. So what happens when you just cause prices to go up? Right. So, so what they do is if we print more money, we're going to increase the demand. I mean, increase the supply of money, push the prices down. We're going to, in the process, lower interest rates. That's going to do what? Make me want to borrow more money to increase spending, so it works two ways. Right. That's what happens. If they decrease the money, so hopefully you're getting that increase in the demand for money because hey, it's cheaper, and I'm going to go and borrow more, and I'm going to buy it. And Sam's going to say, well, I'm forget about saving and not going to spend it. So that's what you do. By printing money, they control, they're tweaking our supply and demand for money. And by doing that, that is going to naturally increase the interest rate. Because Haley, she's going to be looking at, well, prices are going up. I'm going to jack up my interest rates. She doesn't need the government to tell her that. She's a smart cookie. If prices are going up, I'm going to jack up my interest rates. So she's going to, it's going to happen automatically. If there's fewer dollars out there, those dollars are going to be more valuable. So prices are going to be going down. You know? So she doesn't have to charge as high an interest rate. It's going to happen organically. But that's what they do. They print the money supply. And what they do is they target what the interest rate is that they want the interest rate to be. Yeah. So the more they print, the higher the interest rate. The more they print, the lower the interest rate. But what they're going to do is, let's say, according to my example, let's say the interest rate right now is 5%. They can sit there and they can say, well, we really want it to be 4%. Well, at 4%, we think this is the demand for money, so what do we got to do? We need to create the money supply out to here. We need to print that much more money. And I know that was a bunch of pronouns for those of you following along at home, but I could draw it on board with just put it in there. So that's what they do. They will target what they want the interest rate to be, and then they're going to adjust the amount of money that's printed and out there floating around accordingly. And it's printing money. It's when you get the old, ratty, beat up, torn up, shredded up, looks like it's been licked by a dog dollar bill and you take them to the bank well the bank turns them into the government and they get fresh clean ones they rotate it through and all that kind of stuff and you know, that's how they can you know, be fast about it be slow about it the exchange and all that you know, they they've got several different tricks for doing this but this is ultimately what they do that's one so what i had is they want to increase change if they want to increase the interest rate, they go in the opposite direction. They would start doing the things to decrease the money supply. Right. Unless right. Right. So, uh, reserve requirements, so the banks start lending it out. All that kind of stuff to try to slow things down. And borrow. And they can borrow more money, which is pulling money out of the economy by selling more bonds, pulling money out of the economy, which we're kind of getting. Thing. Uh, so ultimately, I think I pretty much just said this by changing the money supply. That's going to change the interest rate that we just drew, and that's going to change the way I feel about borrowing money to spend it, the way businesses feel about borrowing money to spend it, the way you and I feel about saving money. Changes the way the government feels about borrowing money and spending it. Change the way farmers feel about buying our products. So you raise interest rates, it's going to be less spending, less investment slows down the economy. They lower interest rates, more spending, more investment. Pretty much sure he said that, but he was Oh, that's why. <laughs> and why you call him the
Okay, so the way, the primary way that the Federal Reserve doesn't, is guess what? Our demand for money changes every day. So this target about amount of money that needs to be out there is going to change on a kind of daily basis. Because if it's like a freezing cold day out there, what are we not doing? We're not going out shopping, we're staying home in front of the fire, so there doesn't need to be as much money floating around. But if it suddenly is like a beautiful 70 degree day, the 20th of December, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to go out and do some extra Christmas shopping. So what they do is what's called open market operations. The primary way they do it for this tweaking is there's government bonds that are already out there. We've talked about them. It's in I owe you, I will pay you in the future, signed by Uncle Sam, for various amounts. And so what they will do is Federal Reserve will either buy some of these to get them out of your hands and give you cash in return, which is increasing the money supply. Or they have a pile of these that they've already bought in the past. Maybe they'll end up selling some of these IOUs to get your cash away from you, take cash out of the economy. It's just that simple. You know, and they can do that just on a daily basis, just anytime two o'clock this afternoon, they may say, well, we need to sell some more bonds. They can do that. We're changing the reserve requirements for a bank. That's kind of a bigger hammer, and it takes a while for that one to happen. Because they gotta come up with the rules, send it out to all the banks, the banks does it, oh crap, and then they gotta start adjusting how much you're gonna be lending, not lending, and okay. that one takes a while. But the open market operations have to sit there and will buy and sell for these IOUs. And that's what the Federal Reserve, they'll end up talking about. They're going to have their meeting, next meeting, I think it's this week, I think maybe Thursday. And they're going to talk about, are well, we going to raise interest rates another quarter of a point? And if they say yes, what are they going to do? Sell more bonds. If they want to raise interest rates, they want to, let me step, step that one through. I, you, technically. Um, they want to raise interest rates. They want to be more valuable. They want inflation, so they want less money out there, so they won't sell bonds to take the money out. Yes. That's a whole brand. Yes. That's where my brain is. That's what I'm saying. I told you at the beginning of the semester, I have to do these flying demand curves because I don't get this because I can't memorize them. What do they sell them to Huh? What do they sell them Out there on the bond market, just like the stock market, you got the New York Stock Exchange where we buy and sell shares of Microsoft and that kind of stuff. There's a bond market out there. <laughs> Where Microsoft and Google and them all, they'll sell bonds. Just like they sell stock, they sell stock here. Take part ownership of the companies. When they had this other piece of paper, they said IOU, $10,000 in December 2020, signed Microsoft. And you can buy and sell these things all day. And the government, they just sell some of them. It's got an Uncle Sam signature on the bottom of it instead of Uncle Microsoft. Yeah, probably a bunch of you probably maybe have one of them sorting around. And if you do, okay, just here's your homework set. Pull it, find it, pull it out, look at it. It's going to say something like Series E or Series E E or something like that. Find out what it is and look it up. Because some of them, once they hit maturity, They'll continue earning interest. So you may walk in there to the bank with a savings bond that says one hundred dollars, and you lay down on the counter, and they'll give you one hundred five, one hundred ten, one hundred fifteen, because it's matured past its maturity date. But there's some of them that once it hits whatever that maturity date, it doesn't right, it doesn't grow anymore. So that piece of paper is just sitting there collecting dust, losing value because prices are going up and the value of this thing isn't going up anymore. So you can check. You can look online, you put in whatever that series, whatever, whatever code, and you can go online and it to, it'll tell you exactly how much the thing is worth. And it'll let you know whether you need to, yeah, this thing ain't growing anymore. If nothing else, it ain't growing anymore, cash in the bond, speak of money, save these hands, it'll be growing a little bit. Right, Connor? Right. Exactly. <laughs> he is definitely not my wife. <laughs> You want to agree with me? Let's see. Here's one. Blank. So, all right. I already said this here. The Federal Open Market Committee, that is the committee of the Federal Reserve that makes the decision about buying 
or selling the bonds, be putting cash in or taking cash out of the economy. That's the way they do it. Very good. Oh, and why do you keep saying so? Open market and FOMC are two different. No, open market is what they do. Oh, it's the thing that they do, and FOMC is the group that does it. Part of the federal, federal Open Market Committee that I will not test you on, and it will not even be extra credit. Thank you. I mentioned that. Unless you want to like be like, walking around like it, the next year's Thanksgiving dinner, like trying to drop some knowledge on people. So, we've kind of talked about this roundabout, but just for you OCD people, let's tie it all together, put a bow on it, and stick it under a tree here. Monetary stimulus, this is just like you know, fiscal stimulus where the government's going to increase their spending or they're going to lower taxes in order to speed up the economy. Monetary stimulus is where the Federal Reserve is going to try to speed up the economy or slow it down. We've, we've already talked about all of this. But the goal of the monetary stimulus is to increase our demand for products by messing with interest rates, lowering them. So I'm more willing to borrow money to buy a TV. I'm more willing to borrow money to buy a car. I'm more willing to borrow money to hire staff. I'm more willing to do that. Who says they can remember? So, so the goal here is if we want to speed up the economy, federal stuff like we can speed it up a little bit or whatever, we will do our thing, get more money floating around out there. We to do our thing to lower interest rates and that's going to increase investing and which increases big ticket consumption. What are the things you borrow money long term borrowing for? Cars, cars. Houses. houses and cars. And then for businesses, it's your tools, equipment, your machines, your buildings, your land, that kind of stuff. I hope you aren't going and borrowing money to buy your groceries. Tuition. Tuition, yes, that's another big ticket one, and that's a long term thing. Hopefully. You're not doing long-term loans for short-term items. Like doing a 30-year loan in order to buy your groceries this month. I hope you're not in that situation. But just so if you're borrowing money, you're spending money on a credit card and you don't pay that credit card off every month, what did you just do? You just took a short-term purchase and turned it into a long-term purchase and you're gonna be paying interest and lose it worth whatever you bought. Well, I bought it because it's a good deal. I saved $10 on it. And you're going to take four years to pay it off and end up paying $35 worth of interest in order to save 10. It's not more. It's not more. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. monetary stimulus is the same as monetary policy. Well, monetary policy is the policies, the tools, the rules that they do. And this is one part of it. I'll stimulate the economy, the other part is to slow down the economy. Those are the two policy directions. Remember, we have policy directions and the fiscal policy chapters. Same thing here. The directions of the policies stimulate the economy, contract the economy, and then the way they do it is doing the interest rates and, in this case, for monetary policy, doing the interest rates and the money supply. Okay. So the idea here is increasing investment is going to kick off multiplier effects. I think I heard that this two weeks ago. Okay, remember, Haley lends me this hundred dollars, and I do what with it? I spend it. I went to Lovely Store because she has a little store. Y'all know that. I went and I bought a hundred dollars worth of sundrop from her that I wouldn't buy. So now she's got an extra hundred dollars in her cash register, and what is she going to do with it? Spend it. Well, some of it's going to be given to sundrop company for the soda that she sold me, but then some of it's going to go in her pocket as profit that she's going to spend on what? You have an extra forty dollars. What do you spend it on? If I gave forty, okay. If I gave Loveling forty dollars today, she's gonna spend it on M and M's. And okay, apparently she's buying the M and M's from. Sure. It's all in the store. Yes, I just I, I can't believe I'm utterly blanking on your name though. So. Um, Jay. So, so Jenny, so she just sold forty dollars worth of the extra forty dollars worth of M and She went and sell thirty. That's going to go to the M and company. And so, what are you going to do with that extra ten dollars? Buy some yarn. Buy some yarn. Who are you buying it from? Um, the llama store. So, here to pleasure. Oh, uh, llama store. Well, that's the llama store. Yeah, they have really good yarn. Um, Sam, Sam has llama. Okay, Sam is selling 
Hey, Sam, you just sold an extra ten dollars worth of yarn, and you made it using your own llamas in the backyard, apparently. So it only cost you two dollars. You got an extra eight dollars. So what are you going to spend it on? You don't know because your sister can steal it from it, right? Okay. Yeah. So what's what's the other thing that's going to spend it on? Yeah, what she says. Okay. But you see what happens is I borrowed a hundred dollars and was sitting there collecting dust in Haley's savings account. But what happened? Okay. I spend a hundred. Lovely spend an extra forty. Jenny spend an extra ten. Asthma is spending an extra eight. So we had a hundred and what one hundred fifty-eight dollars worth of spending because I borrowed a hundred. Right. That's the multiplier effect. Oh, and it's not counting the fact that you know. The M and M's, M and M Mars got an extra hundred dollars or forty dollars from the M and M's. Suntrop got an extra sixty dollars from the Suntrop that I bought. Really? So, so that money's going to go into the pockets of their employees. Maybe their employees are not likely to get laid off or have their hours cut back. And that kind of stuff. What are they going to do with that money? They're going to spend it. And then, like, sales tax on that too. Yes. So you got the sales tax on the same day, Virginia. Cousin Southfield are going to be getting that much more too, along the way. Um, yeah, Cousin Southfield. Anyway, I'm just. <laughs> okay, so multiply effects. So that 100 by lowering your interest rates to encourage me to borrow that extra $100, may end up calling two, three, four hundred dollars worth of extra economic activity. So that's why they don't have, a lot of times they don't have to do a whole lot. To get this extra little tweaking, an extra little nudge here, a little nudge there, to sort of speed things up, slow things up. They brought you car, going back to that analogy, you cruise control. And you're doing you're, you're doing 65 or whatever, and then your car speeds up one mile an hour. How hard is it, how much harder is that car working to just to do that little tweak? You may not even hear it. You may not even notice it. You may not even realize that your car is speeding up a bit, speeding, slowing down a little bit, because it's just a subtle little, it doesn't take a whole lot. It's not like your car is downshifting or <laughs> in order to make up that extra one mile an hour to get, right? It's just subtle little tweaks there. Oh, that's, what was that number four? Yeah. And my mouse keeps moving, so I hate this keyboard, and it's just absurd. Okay, so to do this stimulus, they're going to increase money supply. Maybe create more money. They're going to increase money supply by lowering the reserve requirements that banks have. So, hey, y'all got to go ahead and lend it out. And then they're going to reduce interest rates to make people like Sam less likely to put money in the savings account and make people like Haley more willing to, or make people like me more willing to borrow money. Right. So, that's what they're going to do. Both of these are going to lead to an increase in total demand, which is going to lead to more jobs because sun drop workers are making $60 more sun drop. M&M workers are making $30 more M&Ms. The Sam's making two more dollars worth of yarn from his llamas. But can't that make um, lenders a little more unwilling to lend, though? Oh. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, we'll come to that on the very next slide, which I double click there. Um, <laughs> okay. But when you in, but if the opposite of stimulus is what we call the restraint, it ain't contraction. We're not really slowing down the economy. Well, we they kind of are a little bit, but they're going to do that if prices are getting too high. If the demand for stuff. Whatever that stuff is. If the demand is getting higher, what happens to prices? They get higher, and then what happens to people like grandma on a fixed income? She's getting left behind, right? So if prices are going up too fast, the government's going to say, the Federal Reserve is going to say, ooh, we need to slow down a little bit. And so they're going to do monetary restraint, which is going to be the opposite effects. They're going to be raising interest, raising interest rates for contracting the money supply to try to slow it down. But the Federal Reserve has these ideas of what we think needs to happen. Just like your car has the idea of, hey, I'm doing 64 and my driver told me I'm supposed to do 65. So I need to speed up just a hair, right? So the Federal Reserve gives these ideas, but there's obstacles in the way. And the number one that Jenny was asking about is reluctant lenders. 
the Federal Reserve might be saying, we y'all need to lay more money, y'all, but you know, it's a Federal Reserve. So right. y'all some of their things are. But we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We had a bunch of banks back in 2008, 2009, well, all through the 2000s. They were lending money to people to buy houses, and what ended up happening? These people didn't pay their loans off. And so the banks got burned with a bunch of loans that people didn't repay. So then suddenly, here I am a bank. How do I, how does a bank make money? By taking Haley's money and lending it to somebody else, and they get a little cut of the profit. And suddenly, the banks are stuck with a bunch of used houses that they can't sell, that the value of is going down. So the banks got a little bit ticked because we got burned. So banks got very, very cautious. Once we did get into the recovery in 2010, 2011, banks still were being a little bit cranky on the rules about who they would lend money to and how much they would lend to. So how do they do the houses if the people had to pay? Oh, the bank foreclosed it. Because the house is a collateral. If you don't pay, if you borrow $100,000 to buy the house, the bank, the only reason why the bank is going to lend you that money is because that is secured, it's a secured loan by the house. If you don't pay them the money, they get your house. Oh, so after you've paid the whole house. After you've paid the whole house off, it's yours. But say you buy a $100,000 house from Haven, First National Bank of Haven. You borrow $100,000 to buy a house. And over the course of two, three years, you paid five thousand of it off. You still owe her ninety-five thousand. You quit paying her. She takes your house. You get kicked out. It's called foreclosure. You're kicked out. She takes your house. She sells your house. And if she manages to get more than ninety-five thousand out of selling your house, you get the extra. But if she cannot sell your house for full ninety-five thousand, guess what? You're still on the hook for the rest of it, unless you declare bankruptcy. And hopefully the judge or whoever will forgive you that extra little bit difference there. But she's going to be taking house because she ain't going to be on the hook letting you live in a house not paying for it with her money. I'm saying if you buy, you know, borrow the money, buy the house while you still paying for the house. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. You've only paid five thousand out of the one hundred. You still make payments every month for the bank and for the buyer. So you had to finish. Oh, so, no, because when you borrow money from Haley, you, buy you give it to the homeowner, the, the seller. They get theirs immediately. And so you aren't borrowing the money from the homeowner, because the homeowner, the seller doesn't have that much money because they're a construction group or something like that. And so you go to the bank, borrow the money to pay them to get the house. And so then the only financial responsibility is between you and Haley. The, Sellers out of the picture. Just like when you buy something with a credit card, when you go home, you're done with Best Buy, you're done with Walmart. It's just between you and the credit card company. And that's why stuff like you a lot of places are okay with selling for a credit you let you do the purchase with a credit card because they don't have to worry about the collections. They don't have to worry about hiring good family people, Jimmy the Swirl, like the good people to come and break your legs and money back. All that's on the credit card company. So, um, so if Haley has lent money to me and got burned, Haley lent money to Allison and got burned, Haley lent money to Amanda and got burned, Haley, are you going to lend money to anybody? Uh, how big of a hurry are you going to be to lend money on to the next person? Years. Years. Or you're going to be, you know, Tyler, oh, you want to borrow money? And that's fine. Well, let me run a full background check, and I'm going to check all your social media accounts, and I'm going to hunt down everything. I'm going to hire the FBI, and I'm going to investigate your butt, maybe in three months we'll talk. That's kind of, it wasn't quite that bad in 2010, 2009, 2010, 2011, but it almost, the banks are getting very cranky. And the whole time, we're in a recession. Unemployment is going from about 5% to 12%. And the government's saying we need to increase spending, y'all, because we're in a recession. Yeah. And it couldn't get the banks to cooperate because the banks were like, what was that? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah, right? That's the way they work. And even now, it still is harder to borrow money now than it was in 2007, 2008. We talked about that last week when we talked about Jenny trying to get the credit card. I used 
There's many of y'all college age students. I y'all get credit card offers in the mail every weekend. I would gladly send you credit card. But they weren't willing to give Jamie credit card. I just recently signed up for a Disney credit card. I'll just give Jamie credit card. That's what I was giving. Did they give it to you? Like, you, you got a version of it? Yeah, they just said they're going to send it to me in the mail. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> at this point, okay, because you don't have much credit, but in a year or two, it's not going to be Don't much. just cut the card in half, call and cancel the account. We're not going to have time to talk about that in more detail this semester, but maybe next semester for all one of you that's going to be this last thing. So, elected lenders to banks, maybe. The Federal Reserve may be saying increased money supply in banks, maybe like maybe new uh, Number two is low expectations. If you're, you're sitting there saying, great day, inflation is going, it's going nuts. The economy is so big, or you're sitting there saying, great day, the other, rather the opposite, unemployment is going up, up, up. I've got money. Am I going to spend it? Or maybe I'm like, well, dude, unemployment's going up, the economy's getting bad, maybe I need to save this money for a rainy day, right? Well, the Federal Reserve may be wanting us to be spending more money, and they're trying to lower interest rates to get us spending more money, but we're feeling a little less than confident because, hey, interest rates are going down, the money in my savings account ain't growing much value, and it looks like, you know, the economy's in trouble, maybe I ought to hold out some of this money in case I'm, my butt loses my job next, right? At the time they want to encourage spending, you and I might be a little afraid to spend. But in all fairness, like that's pretty uh, pretty safe feeling to have. To, like nobody's out there telling you, "Hey, we need you to spend money to help the economy." Yes, yeah. like everybody's pretty much blind at that point, so it's a pretty natural thing. Yeah. <laughs> The president of the United States is not going to come on TV that it's a national emergency, y'all. Go to Best Buy. Save the world. No, they're not going to do that because it, it, that is a tough one to explain. We need y'all to come off of your savings to do some spending to help save other people's jobs who you may not know on other parts of the country, maybe even other parts of the world because half of the stuff we buy ends up being imported to right? It's, it's, you know. It's kind of a tough one to explain to people, and they can't do it in a little 30 second sound bite, and then everybody else sounds out after that. So it's, it's ugly. As good economic students, maybe in the future, next time the economy starts struggling, y'all will like, stand up and put on your Superman cape and take one for the team and go out and spend money. But because all three of us are really going to yes. save the economy. Yes. I don't buy some sports. I love them. But well, when you can absolutely buy local when you can, because our, our part of the economy needs more help than other parts of the economy. Yeah, I know they come out of the last two weeks. Through line, through line. Well, maybe it's your attitude. No, I didn't hear that. <laughs> through line of blacks, I don't know if y'all do, but um, we have this water that's packaged. And well, I mean, it's like it's a million gallons of water. Okay. And I tend to buy that. It's a little bit cheaper than. Other water too, but I mean, it's so I try to buy that. Let's go ahead. We have a little local left. Oh, this last year. I thought I would purchase first. I actually, I, I, I had to go in and get milk Sunday. I mean, it's like military operations. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
that you want to do the expansion, you want to do whatever, same if you got planes to buy some more llamas, but he's like, I'm going to hold on to that money and I'm going to put, put, put this money in an envelope, seal it, write the word llama on the front of it, and I'm going to stick it on the counter somewhere and wait for things to improve until I feel more confident about my purchase of the llamas. And then the fourth is global money. Well, the Federal Reserve might be messing with reserve requirements, telling American banks uh, don't lend so much money, but they don't have control over banks on any other part of the planet, right? So if somebody wants to borrow money, they can go to an American bank, the American bank says no, well, like, okay, well, let's call First National Bank of Canada, see what they can do. It's kind of an issue there. Okay. Yeah, you can borrow money from any bank that you can borrow money from. Or any company that you can borrow money from. Knock yourself out. Uh, Wouldn't it be hard for you to have a country though? Because yeah. um, aren't our credit things like national rather than international? But they can charge you a higher interest rate, probably. But maybe just maybe the way you borrow money is you sell them an IOU, and the way you can get away with this because they know who you are, because your name isn't Jamie or Sam, your name is Microsoft or Google, right? So these companies can borrow money from other companies, other banks, and from other investors, other people from anywhere on the planet. Okay. So the more famous you become, the more people you can sell bonds to, the easier and cheaper you can borrow money. Because Haley ain't going to lend money to Tyler because she doesn't really know me very well. Haley ain't going to lend money to me because she knows me too well, she doesn't trust me. But there's other people that Haley knows, like Haley's grandma, would you lend money to your grandma? Yes, because she knows her. Know if you, you know your grandma fairly well, right? Yeah. So the more people know you and the better they know you, the more options you have for borrowing money. So don't sit at home by yourself. Get out there and make yourself known. Let the world feel your presence. Boom! <laughs> anyway, that was inspirational. So, um, okay. We've had real income. We've had real wages. We've had real GDP. Well, let's get real again. Last time this semester, you have a real interest rate, which we might have talked about this already. It's the interest rate after inflation. I think maybe we had this at the end of the last chapter or the end of the month. I think we can move forward. But the real interest rate is how much hey, how much money is Haley making off of me beyond what she's losing the interest. Remember, I don't know if you remember, she lent me hundred dollars last week. They all left two weeks ago. She lent me a hundred dollars. I paid her a hundred and five in return. But the problem is prices went up three percent during that time. So of that hundred and five I gave her, the hundred and three that hundred and three of that is just me making up for the loss of value money. So she only really made two percent profit off of it. Because what she used to be able to buy for a hundred dollars now it's gonna cost her a hundred. So, the nominal interest rate, the nominal interest rate, oh, come on, you, why do you keep moving? Okay, oh, I don't even have a nominal on there, just because you've seen this without that. The nominal interest rate, that's going to be the number that's on the sign in the bank. That's going to be the number that's on the bank of your credit card. It's going to be the number on the sign. Haley's charging you 5% interest, which is really only making 2% profit off. I know I'm paying 5%, that's the nominal rate, but in reality, the real rate is 2%. So, brain stepping time for a moment. It's not too bad, but here we go. And I color coded, if you're colorblind, well, just three letters, hopefully you can see them. I don't think they contrast flash too bad. We have an equation here. The equation of exchange, see that way my work would work. Yeah, on one side, Money supply and velocity of circulation. How many dollar bills are there and how often do they get spent? I'm just, I'm oversimplifying this. It's insane. Just, just, just run with it. Just so you understand how to do it. How many dollars are there? How often do they get spent? You boss pays, you, you, you collect a, you collect a dollar and you spend it. Well, that dollar doesn't suddenly get ripped up and thrown away. What, what did uh, Loveling do with that do the money that I paid her? She spent it again. 
And what did uh, Jenny do with it? She spent it again. What did Sam do with it again? She spent it again, right? That's how often is money being spent? How much money is there? How often is it spent? That's one side of the equation. Well, the other side is price and quantity. How much stuff got sold and how much did it get sold for? How many cans of Coke? How much price of Coke? How many chainsaws? How much price of chainsaw? Add it all together and what is this B and Q equal? Oh, the GDP. Because we're talking the entire economy here. So our GDP, nominal GDP, oh, I can't draw. Real GDP is Q. How much stuff did we sell, right? Nominal GDP, the GDP number that you'll hear on the news, is how much stuff did we sell and how much did we sell it for? So in total, how much money did we make selling all the stuff that we sold? You got me there? B times Q is going to be how much money total we made selling all the stuff that we made. So that is GDP. So for all the money that gets spent on stuff, we have to make up for, we have to figure out how much money there is. And that's how many dollar bills are there and then how many times they get spent. So this equals out. Does that make sense to you? It ain't working. It ain't rocket science, so I hope, hope I so. uh, Hopefully you're with me on this. Uh, this one will be on the test. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm 98 percent sure. Just in case. I'm gonna take you to the next level. But I'm not gonna have you doing math with it, but I just want you to grasp the concept here. I'm trying to think of a very terrible metaphor, but I can come up with one, so. Um, what chapter is this? That's not a good question. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, ask me that at the end of the rest of the chapter, end of the class, the whole month, the whole chapter cover. So, all total, how much money that we made doing all the work that we did, selling all the stuff that we did? Well, all that money had to come from somewhere. How many dollar bills were there? How many times did each one get spent? So it equals out. So we can measure the economy. So that's why we can measure the economy in terms of dollars. Dollars being spent because it's going to equal out. So we're just sort of looking at the same thing two different ways. Ooh, okay, weird, terrible weird metaphor, but it kind of works. Just for, if you're colorblind, uh, if, for those of you that are colorblind, you come up to stop signal. How do you know to stop versus keep going? Because you see the red light. For colorblind people, what do they do? They look at the light that's on top, right? They're looking at the same thing with two, two different ways. One of them is what color is it? The other people are asking which one on the stack is it, right? But you're looking at the same question in there. We're looking for the same result, asking two different questions. That's what we're doing here. So, I know that because my father's color one. And after eating his marijuana brand, he's looking to be color one. So, <laughs> So here, so, so let's get some brainstorming here for a minute. This is where things get weird. Remember the monitors? We had Keynesians, we had classicals, and I just sort of brushed past monitors a little bit, and they're sort of like, well, we need sets of rules and just leave things alone. Well, this is your time because this is a monetary policy chapter, right? It's time to give the monitors their moment in the sun. And what the monitors are saying, well, on the one side of the equation, we got M and V. And we kind of think that, that V is pretty stable. It's pretty constant. Yeah. Loveline ain't going to spend money any faster this week than she did last week. Jamie's not going to spend money any faster this week than she did last week. Sam's not going to spend money any faster this week than he did last week. So that same dollar bill is going to be circulating. It's going to get spent pretty much the same amount. The dollar is going to get spent the same number of times this year that the dollar gets spent last year that the dollar gets spent the year before. There's not a whole lot of changes. It's not like Lovely's going to wake up and, oh, man, I can't have this money in my wallet. i got to spend it now. I got to, as soon as I get it, it's burning a hole in my pocket. And I got to get rid of it. She don't, you don't think that way, right? No. Yeah. She, our changing, uh, we don't 
Have any of you ever thought about how fast we spent money before? Have you ever thought about that? Two of you. Okay. Well, y'all are strange. The rest of we don't even think about it. Just we just we spend money when we spend money buying whatever we're buying. And just usually it's about after uh, my paycheck is up. It's gone. Oh, that's yeah. that one. one yeah. of you, you acknowledge the fact that money comes well, but but the speed of it it changes. You get paid on Friday, you broke on Saturday. Next week you get paid on Friday, you broke on Saturday, all right? So it just start spending tends to be fairly constant. So what they're saying is on the you have MV equals PQ. On the MV side, the V doesn't change. The only thing that's gonna change is the L. So they're gonna say messing with M is really gonna cause changes in the economy. Changing money supply. Changing money supply is going to have a huge profound impact on the economy because velocity is fairly stable. And so any change in M is going to show up either on the P or Q side of things. Right? But does it increase M also? No, because V. No, you have extra money, and that's not going to make you go to the bank any faster. Our velocity is generally stable. But the, but the monitor is like, but we kind of think the Q quantity is pretty stable as well. How much of our paycheck do we spend each week, each month? All of it, right? We just sort of came to that conclusion two minutes ago. Right. Sorry about it. <laughs> we spent all of our money. So, your income this year, your income last year, your income this week, your income last week is relatively safe, and you spend it all. So the monitors are thinking generally quantity is pretty stable. Let's think about it. Quantity is stable. You're still paying your house payment. You have one. You're still paying your electric bill. You're still paying your phone bill. You're still paying your internet bill. You're still paying your cell phone bill. You're still paying insurance. Insurance. Good one. You're still making your car payment. You're still paying your electric bill. Oh, I did say that one. Okay, and then you still eating, right? So how much does your spending really change week to week, month to month? Not a whole lot. What, what you spend some of that money on might change a little bit. Because maybe your electric bill is lower this month, so that means you have to have a little bit of extra money. So, hey, I'm going to go ahead and buy a new pair of tennis shoes this month. Or maybe this month you buy a pair of tennis shoes, next month you buy a video game, something like that. But overall, spending... Monitor say it's fairly stable. The amount of stuff we buy is relatively stable. So, if M is the only thing on this side that's really going to change, and Federal Reserve controls that, well, what happens if they change M? P will change. Something's got to change on P and Q side of it, and they say Q ain't going to change, so P is going to change. So what happens if they print more money? The only thing that's going to happen is prices are going to go up. You couldn't cause inflation. You're not going to create new jobs. You're not going to get new stuff being built and bought and that kind of stuff. You're just going to create inflation. This is their argument, which is why they say you just come up with a rule for what the monetary supply, what the money supply is going to be, and just stick with it. Come up with a rule and leave it alone so everything is nice and stable. Everything is smooth. And I certainly hinted at it a couple weeks ago. If the population is going to be 3% bigger this year than last year, well, we got 3% more people. We need 3% more money to cover the 3% more spending. Boom. Increase money supply equal to the growth of the population each year. Done. So then the M is going to go up by 3%. The P is going to go up by 3%. Or maybe the Q, in that case, the Q would go up because we got the 3% more amounts. So P doesn't change. And if you do anything beyond that, you can start breaking things and causing inflation. That's their argument. So the uh, stable quantity means the quantity of goods is basically dependent on production capacity, efficiency, and other structural forces, which lead to a natural rate of unemployment. Boom. Okay. See you later in a little bit. So. Any thoughts on that? I'll have you look like the monitors and Yeah. I mean, oh, the. Let's go back. Um, 
Are they right? Yeah. Kind of. Okay, the government says, okay, we want to increase money supply. So they're going to load less, they lay lower interest rates. So I borrow more money, not to buy SunDrop, I borrow more money, buy a TV, something like that. So the TV makers are going to sit there and they're going to say, what? We've got more people knocking on the door saying, give us a TV or give us debt. We can sell more TVs. If we had more TVs, but how long does it take them to make more TVs? It might take a while. So what do they do in the meantime? Price is going. So that's what ends up happening. We, we talked about that when we had whoever running the bakery or whatever. Prices are going to go up in the short term. And then in the long term, maybe if it's a long term sustained day after day, week after week, people are showing up saying, I want more TVs, give me more TVs. Oh, okay, well, you want more money? Well, I'll gladly pay you because i got to have my TV. Then they will eventually hire more workers, buy more equipment, start making more TVs, and then the price of TVs will go down. But in the short term, what's going to end up happening? Yeah, they're going to raise the prices. Look at how fast the gas station raises their prices, right? The night going down. Yeah. Yes, it's going down at the moment. But prices change pretty quickly, especially in the upward direction. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. They're in a hurry. If they got to raise the prices, they're in a hurry to raise them. If they got to lower them, well, maybe they're going to walk across the parking lot instead of running, but they're going to they'll get to it sometime in the afternoon. But prices, it's a whole lot easier and faster to change prices than it is to change your production. Hire more workers, buy more machines, equipment, and that kind of stuff. So Q, relatively stable, and it's going to be, it, 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 it's going to grow in fits and starts. Because half of what's driving you is that supply side stuff that we talked about, new technology, new productivity, and all that kind of stuff. So, maybe the monitorists are onto something. Too bad they don't have a political party. So. But if you're Keynesian, hashtag Democrat, if you're Keynesian, you're going to say, well, if we want to fight unemployment, the economy's growing a little bit too slow. We got people out of work. Well, one of the things we'll say to do is expand money supply, lower interest rates. We'll print more money. We'll get the banks to lend more money. We'll lower interest rates to make the borrowers more willing to borrow money. But the moderates say, you aren't going to create, because of what we just talked about, you aren't going to create jobs. All you're going to do is create inflation. We kind of saw that, I don't know if you remember two, three weeks ago when we were in fiscal policy, when we were talking about campaigns, and then I was shifting the aggregate, the bank, and the aggregate supply curves, and that kind of stuff. It's like, you ended up getting economic growth the Keynesian way, but you ended up with higher prices there, right? So let's see. So, what they do agree on, both the campaigns and the moderators, is Messing with money supply is the thing. You can't really mess with velocity. Can the government come up and you say, start spending money faster? No. no. Can they do anything to make you spend money faster or spend your money slower? Mm -hmm. no, not really. I mean, what? Drinking problems. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Bobby talked about it like 10 minutes ago. We're like, you know, can, can they do you? Know, can a president get up there and make that whole thing about, you know, yeah, our economy's slowing down, we all need to spend more money on this. Yeah, but inflating the interest rate is messing with him, not me. Uh, so it's, it's a lot tougher to change me, to get people to spend money faster. You, you, you get more money, you spend it at the same speed that you're already spending your current money. Naturally, that's a space. Natural disaster can impact V, both the positive and the negative, depending on who you are and that kind of thing. But, um, and the, the nature of disaster, if you were a victim of said disaster. But, every day. Okay, well, the federal, so the federal government's going to say, oh, we need to treat the economy, let's create a federal uh, national disaster. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's say California on fire, see what happens. No. Uh, yeah. so, so, well, that would be the easiest way. <laughs> yeah. Even the Democrats, the Kinsians, the ones that are like, yeah, government, get involved and mess with things. Even the Kinsians are saying, 
oh, there ain't really much we can do about velocity. It's going to be about money. So a lot. We can't make people try to spend faster, but we can give them more of them to spend when they are out there spending. Yeah, so monitors and Kinsey's agree that money supply is a tool, it is a weapon to fight unemployment, but you gotta recognize that that tool, like any weapon, you gotta be careful. Um, so, here we go. Crowding out, you remember that? The government getting in the way, throwing its elbows and borrowing what we would be borrowing, buying what we would be buying. So, in this case, the velocity is, con is constant. The change to get changes in spending is only going to be coming by through changes in the money supply. And if the government raises their taxes or borrows money, it's going to crowd us out to keep us from spending and borrowing. So that's getting back to the contrary goals there. They, they can end up raising taxes. They could end up increasing their borrowing. Increase their borrowing in order to get money out there into the economy to speed things up. They're selling IOUs, get cash out there, or no, they're, let me say the fact, they're borrowing money, they're taking cash out, selling this piece of paper, taking cash out, and by you doing that, you're not spending. So, they're kind of getting in our ways. So, what is it? This finish with monitors. Come up with a fixed money supply target, some kind of rule. It's predictable. Everybody, you come up with a rule and you public with what the rule is, everybody's going to know what the rule is. Everybody's going to know how to behave. Everybody's going to know what to expect, unless we have some kind of surprises or natural disasters or government made disasters. But the Kantians say, no, let's not fix the money supply target because it's a tool that we can use to fight unemployment, to fight inflation. And you're sitting there telling us to take that tool and stick it in the toolbox and forget it exists. So they agree there's power in changing money supply, but so the monitors say there's power there, don't mess with it. The Kansas are saying there's power there, let me use it. There's power in this outlet here. The monitors are like your mother. Don't be playing with the outlet. And get little childproof covers and then you stick on the things and nobody can mess with it, right? But if those things are sealed up to where you can't get them and you can't use the outlet, what's the point, right? And that's what the game seems to be saying. Why have an outlet if you can't use the outlet? And the monitors are like, the outlet can kill you and that's why you don't want to mess with the outlet. With great power comes great responsibility. Spider-Man, anyway. The old school Spider-Man. Anybody? Old school Spider Man, but that was still so new because I'm like, that was. Yeah, they did Spider Man, they did three movies, and it was like, what, three years later, and they decided to redo them all again. And it's like, Burr. and three years later, they did what again? Yeah, and then they were around three years old, and it's like, we're not going to talk about Batman, Superman, though. Well, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but some of those early Batman movies needed to be forgotten. Uh, the original one was okay, and then he moved on from the second one and the third one, and he just kept going, and then uh, that okay, then they rebooted with Dark Knight, whatever, and then okay, but then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't say his name. What? M. Night. M. Night. Yeah. He's doing a Batman movie? I thought he did something like that. Oh, I know Christopher Nolan did three of them. Like, uh, that, that would be kind of weird. Batman C. Stanley. Y'all, you remember that movie? Yes, I remember that. So, okay. That's a cheap My brain is so hard. So, generally, what the Federal Reserve does now, most times, normal times, and we're in relatively normal times now, is they're going to be using a mixture of monitors and Keynesian policies. They're not going to be strictly monitors, but they're going to be like, we're going to use monetary, we're going to mess with the money supply, but only a little bit. And we're only going to mess with the money supply to do what we drew up here, target the federal funds rate 
What do we have to do to the money supply? Only to get the federal funds rate where we want it to be. We're not going to get carried away. We're not going to change things around and get interest rates down to zero so the politicians can get reelected, or we're not going to jack them up to 13% so the politicians can all get kicked out of. We ain't going to do that. We're not going to be trying to create jobs, lose jobs, or that kind of stuff. We're just thinking where does the federal funds rate need to be in order to just do that light little tweaking, the subtle little tweaking to the economy, keep us going 65 miles an hour, not 64, not 66. To keep us doing 65 miles an hour. What's the subtle little tweaking that we need? What's that target need to be? We're going to do the subtle little tweaking of the money supply to get that federal funds rate where we think it ought to be. And that's why they can get away with all they got to do is buy a few of these IOUs or sell a few of these IOUs in open market. So they so they'll make the announcement Thursday, I think it is, that whether they're going to say, okay, we're going to be buying a few more bonds. We're going to try to get this federal funds rate up a quarter of a point. And then over the next week or so, they'll buy a bunch of these bonds, and then the federal funds rate is going to march up the yeah, a quarter of a point. I thought they bought the bonds, the interest rate for them. That they get in more money than the economy is spending. Yes. Okay, they will be selling bonds. I was, I was talking about thinking. Well, so the war would like seriously mess up our economy, right? That would be one way that it would, that would be like a federal disaster or whatever. It depends. Where is the war? If the war is within the borders of your country, a yeah. war will screw up your economy, big time. If war is outside the borders of your country, war can be pretty darn good for your economy. Because won't they sell more bonds during war? Because right? that's the thing. Well, like World War I and World War II and yes. all that. So that's why I'm, no. they need more money to spend, not necessarily inside of the state. C plus I plus G plus X. <laughs> when war happens outside the borders of our country, Increase you. the government's going to be spending more money if we're equipping our troops, buying guns, tanks, sending our sailors and soldiers overseas to go in and they shoot and all that kind of stuff. But there's more to it than that. Because, ooh, well, because the sailors and like soldiers are not here, they're not spending money, household production is going down. Business investment may be going up because who's the government buying guns and tanks from? American businesses are going to be spending money to be buying new tools and equipment. So overall, you can end up with growth in the economy, and the government is going to be doing extra spending. But what's happening here? The tax income is probably going to be going down, maybe. Yes. Well, it depends on how many people get hired over here. Right? Okay. So. The government is doing extra spending. The government's going to borrow more money. They're going to be selling bonds. They're going to need to sell bonds in order to borrow money because businesses are not, let's be honest, businesses aren't patriotic. Okay, we'll stop making cars and start making airplanes like you want us to, but we're not going to give it to you for free. We're going to sell them to you. And maybe we're going to sell them on credit. Maybe not. Probably not. Because Sam was buying his house. He bought his house on credit. And Haley was okay lending him money to buy the house because if he didn't pay, what would happen? She get a house. But if the government doesn't pay, make their airplane payments, the business ain't gonna want to repossess an airplane that's been like busted up, shot up, and crashed into the jungles of where it goes, Canada. Yeah, you know, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I try to be politically conservative and control there, right? Yes. So, um, so you can't really use guns and bullets and airplanes as collateral. So you got the government's got to pay cash. So that's why they had all those bond drives back in World War II, World War One, to try to get us to. Well, it costs us to spend less money because we're lending it to the government instead. So it's lowering C a little bit. And it's taking pressure off the producer today. It's okay that we're not making cars, we're making airplanes, because ain't nobody buying cars anyway because they're lending all their money to the government. Right? It is for so. Okay. So. Overall, but you got a whole lot more up arrows going on here than you have down arrows. A war outside the borders of your country is good for your economy. That's how we got out of the Great Depression. World yeah. War II, the buildup leading up to, and then the war itself. However, if the war is inside the borders of your country, like the revolution. Well, the government is increasing their spending, buying the guns and bullets to fight off whoever it is that they're fighting off. 
This is investment. It's going up because the government's buying the bullets and guns and airplanes, but it's going down because our businesses are getting blown up. Or maybe just maybe I don't want to invest a bunch of money to build a new building that's going to be conquered by the enemy in a few weeks' time. Right? So there's kind of question marks for what happens here. Meanwhile, uh, consumption is going down because you go outside, you're we're, we're fighting, we're getting killed. You know, this is, our crops are getting burned, and all the, our buildings, our places where we work are getting torn down and bombed, and that kind of stuff. So we're suddenly unemployed, and again, it's a war within the borders of your country. Pretty ugly. Wait a second, this is going to go a little bit up if the war is outside the country. Oh, we're going to get higher. They're going to invest more money, even if we give some of it. Um, still going to have some. Well, uh. It could, it, it's, generally you think that the C would go down because you have that many fewer people spending money because they're overseas doing fighting. And you might, it, you might have part of that is reversed for the extra hiring of businesses are going to hire people to build the extra airplanes, extra guns, and that kind of stuff. So. Like in the 50s or was it 40s. 40s when the woman started working in factories or whatever. Late 30s, early 40s. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah whole power so, yeah, so, yeah, C might be, so I think C is going to be a little bit fuzzy. If anything, there might be a little downward pressure on it. Especially a big war like World War One and World War Two. there was rationing. You couldn't get tires for your car. You kind of need them. You could you go out there and try to find a 1940, 41, 42 car. Okay, you made 41, yeah, but. You ain't finding them. They weren't making them because nobody was buying them. So we're sitting home and we had all that money. We're lending it to the government instead of spending it ourselves because there wasn't anything to spend it on. Because you go to the grocery store and the only thing you can buy is whatever you have a coupon for because they're crashing. So C's generally going to tend to go down. Do you get interest on the bond? Yes. You can. Because this thing is worth $100, but you only had to pay 80 for it. You give me 80, I give you 100 in future. That's $20 difference. That's your interest. You don't want to pay hundred dollars for these records that doesn't work hundred dollars in the future because that's just losing money. Just like Haley won't lend me hundred dollars and I only have to pay her hundred back in the future. She ain't gonna do that. Uncle Sam ain't gonna do that either. So any any other questions? So oh, chapter, 15. chapter 15. Chapter 15. Yes, there you go. So, any other questions? I will check you right next oh, yes. Of course, yes. I, I never fails that the days that I didn't. A board is broken in the days that are really right on the board. Okay, so the what are we gonna have? What? Uh, oh no no it's it's during exam week. But okay, this is something for It's the thirteenth of December at eleven o'clock here. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, um, let's see, we skip chapter 14, right? And we skip chapter Okay. Okay. And we're going to problem. okay, we're Thursday, whatever that day is, there you the print slides Um we're gonna go to chapter 23. We will finish chapter 23 Thursday, I promise you. It's short. It's a chapter I'm thinking about. There's only 15 chapters. And one of, them is, one of them is real interest rate that we already talked about. Boom. Um, and so we'll do chapters. Yeah, well, we skip. That's, yeah, we skipped two of them. We skipped 23. And then we'll come to 20 and we'll talk about trade. And then if we, we will not have that, we'll come back to 14. But when it does settle, we're only going to miss one chapter and it's the money banking. And it is only nine slides. So if we get finished real early Thursday, well, I might just go ahead and hit that just for fun. Of it. I know. There we go. You have a chapter of all random stuff. Oh, yes. That's random stuff. Of course, it's that way. Okay. We've got five minutes. Random stuff. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me see. <laughs> this isn't slides that I thought it was. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go through this fast. Not on a tip, just for your own fun of it. Start saving for retirement now. Good. If you want to have a million dollars when you turn 65 years old, 
you start at age 25, you only got to squirrel away $655 a month before you want to reach that goal. If you wait until you're 40, we're talking million dollars, yo. But if you wait until you're 45 to start saving, you got to start piling away almost $2,500 a month. Joseph, think that about 125, you're probably out of college and probably have a better paying job. Yeah. So this is This is a tangle. This is a But then you only pay $655 during your 20s, during your 30s, during your 40s, during your 50s, during your 60s. But if you wait, because compound interest, you wait until you're 45, you got to squirrel away $2,500 a month because you only got 20 years to squirrel it away instead of 40 years to squirrel it away. Where if you wait until you're age 55, you gotta save almost $6,500 a month. That's why I'm not even saying you need to be 60. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, the life expectancy in the United States is around 80. Boom. They okay. say uh, In 2017, the life expectancy for men was 76 and for women, 81. Oh, okay, so men, it's not that we just start dying earlier, it's that we We're well, stupid. We're stupid. We're, we're more likely to get killed in gang related shootouts and doing the hey, everybody, watch this kind of stupid stuff. Oh it's, not, it, it's not eating here, and there is a little bit of the inherent unhealthiness of the, you know, where we eat more meat and less vegetables, and so we have more issues and that kind of stuff. No. So it's that, but you take a healthy man, healthy woman, it, it's not going to be that the healthy man's going to drop all five years earlier. It's just that you know, we eat yeah. stupid stuff. So guess what? The listening is Yes. Um, so guess what? The revenue money's trying to You're going to retire. You're retiring at 65. Well, y'all should be full social security 67. Well, guess what? You're going to be collecting social security checks an average of six to 10 years. On average, at least half of you are going to be collecting social security checks for more than 10 years. If they still have social security. If it still exists. Half of you would be collecting it for more than 10 years. That's the problem. We're living longer, so we're taking, there's a whole lot more hands taking money out of Social Security bucket for a whole lot longer than the original percentage. Because when they set up Social Security, the life expectancy was about not even 65. So they were figuring over half of the people weren't going to collect a penny of it, and then the ones that did collect weren't going to collect very long. But and now, over half of you will be collected for more than 10 years, so that's all. A whole lot more right. hands pulling money out of that bucket for a whole lot longer time frame. So, if you look at these 76, we might be interested. So, here you go. If you were to retire at age 65, half of you are going to need to live at least 11 more years. The guys, the ladies are going to be living at least 16 more years. So, how much do you need to save? Well, $10 million for 11 years, that's... Y'all guys living on the equivalent of $89,000 a year. Can y'all live off $89,000 a year? So ladies, that's only $62,000 a year, right? But that's assuming that you are going to keep the bucket right at your life expectancy age. But what happens if you beat the odds? Congratulations, you're healthy in those vegetable years. If you only save a million dollars, the amount of money that you have to live off of year after year after year, that million dollars will be spread over more and more and more a year. Those of you that eat healthy, guess what? You might need 26 or 36 years, and so you're going to be living a $20,000 lifestyle for 36 years. Well, you know, at that point, point, someone's probably taking care of those. Yeah, well, you add on, your, hopefully, your Social Security, then you, you, you're not so, paying medical. But in short word, if you don't want to live a, a minimum wage lifestyle, start saving. Um, in terms of inflation, we've got to deflate this 89,000 number. 89,000 is like 33,000 today. That 22,000 for ladies, that'd be like 23,000 today. So that ain't much for living. How many of y'all did, woo, I'm living large, 23,000. That ain't $2,000 a month. Maybe if you own your house already. Right. If you paid off your house, oh. store. Which means, ooh, you got to pay that house off. You gotta buy that house by the time you're 35. So then you pay off a 30 year loan and you pay that off by the time you're 65 and you're starting to do this, right? No more new cars. We thought we'll be driving that. Oh, you can get the lot. Here's hoping. Uh, but so, about 65 is the new, like, 45. Yeah. I mean, we're healthier. So, financial advisors tell you the plan is if you're gonna live 100. So, Better to oversave 
and live okay. And if you happen to die a little bit early, you die on your 99th birthday, well, you've left a little money for your kids. Your kids, when you're 99, or your kids are what? 70. You ain't responsible for them anymore, right? Who cares about leaving them money? That ain't your responsibility. Your responsibility is to take care of yourself, right? Rest of the money. Go to your kids if you have a well, well written will. Alright? So, plan is if you can live to 100. Because I, I'm willing to bet at least one of you in here is going to make it better. At least one of you in this classroom is going to make it to 100. And it's going to suck if you only save enough money to make it to 80. And then you've got nothing but social security checks for the last 20 years of your life. Well, that could be part of your financial plan, buying lottery tickets. But if you don't win the lottery, it's going to suck if you run out of money. And then suddenly, you become a burden to your kids. Instead of, say, having money for them to inherit, you have no money for you or them, and you become a burden to them, and suddenly, your kids are taking care of you. And there's a rising number of households. I'm going to say, I heard, I heard this like a week ago, it's like 40%, I think, of the households. Or at least 30% are taking care of a kid and an adult. It's like 30% of the households out there, married, married couple, they're, they're taking care of one of their adult kids and one of their adult parents. Don't do that. And meanwhile, you know, start saving as soon as you can. So. Okay. You're with me on that? Okay, well, it's time to stop because I'm two minutes late already. Falsers are gathering, but we may end up talking about a little bit more of this.